Perhaps known as one of the crankiest of the reformers, John Calvin's influence has nonetheless been felt for centuries. A scholar, theologian, and prolific preacher, John Calvin's emphasis on the doctrines of grace places him in rarefied air, shared perhaps only with Martin Luther as a dominant figure of the Reformation era. His teachings had pronounced impact in the English Reformation, Scottish Reformation, and of course, in his adopted home country of Switzerland. Anywhere you find the Reformed, Reformed Baptists, Presbyterians, and many more besides, the theology of John Calvin at least should be found. We talk all things John Calvin on this episode of Theology on Air, part of our season on the Reformers. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening in. I'm Evan McClanahan, the pastor at First Lutheran here in uh, Midtown Houston, joined by Sarah Stone, director hey of... I am the director of community and evangelistic outreach. At, at Memorial... M- yeah, sorry, at MDPC down on the west side. So MDPC org to, to find out more about her. Uh, HoustonTOT.com, we always want you to go there, learn about our leadership team, our events upcoming. Um you know, this podcast uh, has kind of moved into a series format, so we take big old chunks of, of information, try to break it down for you, do our research, bring in excellent guests uh, so that our faithful Theology on Tap fans, Theology on Air fans are, are fed uh, and been given good information. So if you like this, uh, do subscribe and tell your friends about it. Uh, we aim to please and aim to, to bring some um, some education to the church as we can. So Let's talk John Calvin. Our guest today is Aaron Wright. He is a pastor, uh, but I think teaching elder or preaching elder. What's the, uh, you know, we have pastors and right. councils and y'all yeah. have elders. So, d- d- yeah. Tell me so, something. really, uh, at our church as Reformed Baptists, we just have elders. I am the primary uh, preaching pastor. So, I preach uh, mostly every Sunday with the exception of the last one. And that's the Sunday that I'll teach Sunday school. Cool. So. Well, good deal. Grace Family Baptist here in Houston, up on the north side. So, if you're looking for a a, a church home that uh, uh, let's see doesn't baptize babies, but uh, is full on five point Calvinist, you know, uh, that would be the church for you. You know, unlike those Presbyterians, you know, they're still baptizing babies. So. Well, you know my thoughts on that, but that's for another podcast. I hear you. Yeah. So, um, well, let's just kind of jump in. Let's talk about John Calvin. You know who he was. Uh, you know where he was. Sure. So uh, John Calvin was born uh, in 1509, July 10th, at Noyon, uh, France. Luther at the time, and I'd like to look at that. I'd like us to think about John Calvin and where he was born, and what else was going on around him at the time. Uh, Luther was about a generation ahead of him, Mm -hmm. um, and he was serving as a a professor at that time. Uh, Calvin died in 1564 in Geneva, Switzerland, and that is where... Uh, he ministered the the entirety of his life. He married Idolette Calvin in 1540. They were married for nine years. Um, she died after being sick for some time. She's a daughter of an Anabaptist. She was a widow, and they had uh, several children, but they all died in infancy. Oh, that's hmm. really sad. And so, j- just to give a little bit of a timeline on this, so you know, October 31st. 1517, you're very familiar with the day. Mm -hmm. Luther nails the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg uh, Castle, Diet of Worms, 1521. uh, You know, Luther's taken to the Wartburg Castle, um, takes on the name of Knight George, 1521. Uh, He's protected by Frederick the Wise, the Elector of Saxony, and he stays in the Wartburg Castle for, for 300 days and begins to translate the New Testament into German. And so 1522 there, Calvin begins high school. Hmm. So Luther's just getting out of this castle with the uh, German translation or the amount that he's translated of, of the Bible into, into German. And uh, Calvin is about 14 years old, and he is in school in, uh, in Paris, and they're preparing him for, for university study. Um, and uh, Luther's continuing to translate uh, the rest of the Bible. 1525, Luther writes Bondage of the Will. Luther has his famous debate with Erasmus. 1527, uh, Calvin begins to get influenced by Reformed uh, leanings. Although Calvin had a Roman Catholic education, he became more and more influenced by Reformation ideas. Hmm. Um, he moved on in 1528 to study civil law. That's what his father wanted him to do. And he obeyed his father and 
and began to go, go into law. He finishes his studies in 1532 and writes a commentary on De Clementia by a Roman philosopher. And here's, here's the interesting part. So I give you all of this information because mm-hmm. here's the mystery of it all. It is between 1532 and 1536, John Calvin becomes a reformer. Mm. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know why he became a reformer. He became converted in uh, 15, uh, 1533. You can read about that in uh, the intro to his commentary on the Psalms. So this is where it begins to get interesting. Um, 1536, uh, there is a war that breaks out between Francis I and Charles V. Charles V is king of France. Francis I is uh, emperor at the time. And so France is not a safe place. Calvin desires to leave France and go to Strasbourg. Strasbourg at the time was not a part of France. It was a separate, separate area. And he stops in Geneva to rest for the night. He intends to go to Strasbourg because there's other reformers there. And he ends up staying there much longer than a night. What happened in Geneva? <laughs> Providentially, that's where the Lord Lord brought him. He had, you know, Calvin had his intention. I'll go to Strasbourg. I'll mm-hmm. be there. I'll be with the reformers. And the Lord intended to plant him in Geneva. And that's exactly what happened. He ministered there for, for the rest of his life. So they kind of knew, they found out who he was and... Or you know they they needed a preacher and so they implored him to stay kind of deal. That that is it. He had he had a he had someone that began to encourage him to stay. He began to see the need that was there, and he he stayed. If he had it his way, he would have he would have stayed in more of an academic field, not pastorally. Mm-hmm. And clearly, he was an academic with how he wrote, but even in how he wrote with such specificity in theology. Um, he wrote it for the common person. The Institutes wasn't mm-hmm. intended to be, although people may study it in seminaries, it was intended to be a practical outworking of the Christian religion in the life of the well, Christian. Well, let, let's just say, what, what, what are the Institutes? Sure, sure. And I, I, think, I think that um, I'd like to walk directly through that when we walk through Calvin's theology, because I think, I think the Institutes do a really good job of kind of laying that out and laying out Calvin's theology do you want to talk about some controversial issues first, though? Oh, Always. we love we this love what controversy. we do here. Okay, yeah. and there's two in particular uh, that come to mind. The first is a man named Jerome uh, Balsek, and that was in 1551, and he had some issues with Calvin's teaching on on predestination. Now, he wasn't the only one that had issues with with Calvin's uh, Calvin's teaching, and he began to criticize Calvin's preaching within the the Genevan Church. He was arrested by the authorities, and um, the court took Calvin's side. Calvin did have to testify on this. And Balsek was found guilty of holding to an erroneous teaching, and he refused to recant. And they did not burn him at the stake. He was expelled from, from the city, and so he lived many decades after that. Hmm. Um, it doesn't seem that Calvin was against this decision. When you look at the life of Calvin, it, it, there, there doesn't seem to be... Um, as as most of us would nowadays believe that there is this you know understanding that the state shouldn't be carrying out church discipline, um, Calvin did believe that it was a, appropriate for um, the state to carry out violations of the first table of the law or the first four first four commandments, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you kind of see that here with Balsack and most famously with with Servetus in 1553. Um, Calvin had this ongoing uh, conversation with with Michael Servetus. He was one who was an Anabaptist, but just being an Anabaptist isn't very very clear as to what he was. He was also anti-Trinitarian, Uh-oh. and so he was speaking uh, against the Trinity, and he was writing back and forth with Calvin. And Calvin, he said he was going to come to Geneva. Calvin was telling him, "Don't don't come to Geneva." Um, because he knew what would happen if if he went there. And he began to speak uh, in really terrible ways about the doctrine of the Trinity, compared uh, the Trinity to um, uh, um, Cerbeus, the uh, three-headed dog in Greek mythology. Mm. And um, he ended up being convicted, and he was sentenced to death. And Cerbeus ended up being, being burned at the stake. Calvin pleaded that he at least get um, a more humane uh, punishment, such as beheading or something like that. Here, here's the misunderstanding, though. A lot of people will say that 
John Calvin ran Geneva. John Calvin was the mayor of Geneva, and he was the judge and jury in this trial. That's that's not even close to mm. to the reality. He wasn't. Um, he served as he was called in as a witness. He had to testify against Servetus, but he was not um, someone who was serving as judge. And and so he wasn't. He didn't become a citizen of Geneva until 1559. So that's that's a few years, even mm. even after this. It's six years after. After the death of of Servetus, yeah. you said something quite profound, sure. you know, in its implication, yeah. and and I want to make sure we kind of key on it, which yeah. is that Calvin believed that the state could and should carry out punishment for violations of the first table of the law. You know, most people today would hear that and go. <gasps> Yeah. Who would ever dare think yeah. that yeah. the state yeah. should punish for blasphemy, yeah. Yeah. right? Because that that is only done in the you know in Israel where you you don't mm -hmm. have this church state, if you mm -hmm. will, distinction. Was was Calvin really unusual in yeah. advocating yeah. for the state carrying out that yeah. kind of punishment, or was that pretty normal? The reality is that this is the water that Calvin lived in. Mm -hmm. This has been happening for, for centuries. You can look at the Roman Catholic Church, and they were burning people for translating the Bible into their own language. We've been talking about this in some of our past episodes. Yeah. 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 They, you know, they took Wycliffe's bones 30 years after he died yeah. and burned those. And of course, Huss was burned at the stake and, and the Inquisition. And, 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 and while we don't celebrate that, you know, it is a question of sort of social order, right? Mm -hmm. And so someone has to sort of punish the guilty and someone, you know, but Th this... But who decides what's guilty is because it's so funny that up until like when we started talking about the beginning of the reformers, um, the people that were being sort of burned at the stake or punished were, were our guys, right? The guys that were saying yeah. what we now think is yeah. true and right. Yeah. Um, and now you're talking about, I mean, I'm a Trinitarian, but mm -hmm. I maybe just because I live in this, you know, pluralistic society that doesn't seem to me like an offense. Somebody's not agreeing with me about the Trinity that one not to be burned for. Right? Like, that's yeah. pretty intense. And who decides that? Mm -hmm. Was the Catholic Church at this point still making that choice? Well, in Geneva, no. But I would say, too, it's kind of like the Old Testament example of the guy who picks up sticks on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You know, people are like, how could God kill someone for... Well, okay. The guy knew what he was doing. Yeah. He had been properly warned. And the impression is that he was flaunting the law. And that, it was you know, commerce. It wasn't like he was just gathering sticks for fun. Yeah. Like, let's play yeah. a game with five sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... um so it, it, Servetus had ample opportunity to keep his mouth shut. I think mm -hmm. that would be one thing to say. Yes. Um, and he 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 was he was one of these. You get the impression he was one of these guys who was out there, you know, really you know banging the drum of Unitarianism and anti-Trinitarianism. Mm -hmm. You know, not unlike some Unitarians in our own day. And um, you know, he he picked the fight. Okay, let's talk theology. Okay. So so you mentioned predestination earlier. Yes. We. That is again, I think if there's one thing that jumps out at people, yeah. that's the thing. So yeah. but but you can do it in any order you want. I just want to make sure we cover that issue. So. Well let's go let's go to predestination. Yeah. And you know, th there's this, you know, you have you have Tulip. Famously, people understand uh, they they connect John Calvin with the idea of Tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And, so know, when they say five point Calvinist, five point th Calvinist, that's what that means. Be, those okay. would be the five point Calvinist. And you know, when you hear things like five point Calvinist, you hear those five points. Uh, the thought that comes to your mind is, well, this must have been Calvin's thing. You know, this must have been yeah. just his main things. You come to his church, and you're going to hear about this every time you come there. You're going to hear about election and, and 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 predestination. And the reality is, tulip is not something that Calvin created. He hmm. didn't make tulip. And he um, spoke French anyway, so, you know, it would have been a totally different lo <laughs> lotus flower. Tulip. Leap. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so instead, it was it was a response to Calvinist teaching by the students of, of Jacob Arminius. And dun, dun, dun. No. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. We need some ominous <laughs> need, music there. Yeah. yeah, like sound effects when you yeah. say the name of... Jacob Arminius. Yes. Yeah. Say it like that, like Voldemort, yeah. or don't say. Or like it. Darth, Darth, Darth Vader's Imperial March, or something. Yeah, go ahead. The name, the, the name that should not be stated. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. right. Um, and so after his after his death, it was about a year after his death. They they protested um, in Holland at the Senate of Dort, and they had five articles of remonstrance against it. Remonstrance. That's a word we don't use anymore. So these okay. are, yeah, these are areas that they disagreed with. They're saying, we've got a contention with these five areas 
of Calvinistic theology. There's probably a bit more that they had, but um, you know, it, maybe it wouldn't have spelt tulip if they did that. <laughs> um, so, so here's their five issues. First, they said, you know, in regard to human ability, uh, human ability it was damaged by the fall, but it's not totally impotent. Uh, man's will is enslaved to sin, but he's he's basically capable of believing upon Christ prior to yeah. regeneration. Let, let's yeah. let's sit on that just for a Too second. Much. Okay. No, no, it's great, but I just want to make sure people understand yeah, yeah. that that tulip comes after Calvin's life, but it's kind of a summary of Calvinist teachings. Yeah. And so the 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 five articles of remonstrance are against tulip, right? That's exactly right. Okay. Exactly and so right. the first. T for tulip is total depravity, which yes. doesn't mean that we're all Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, no. which I guess we should all watch the Netflix series. Since I uh, so do not recommend. Okay, but another time. Yeah, yeah. And, but anyway, but the point is that we're all not all as bad as we can be per se. But it's that every the totality is that every part of our being is in some way depraved or, or, or totally touched depraved. by depravity yeah. in some yeah. way. Yeah. So our body, our mind, our soul, our spirit. So that's yeah. Right. So if you yeah. understand the law of God rightly, that, that that there's nothing good within you. Like you would get this idea very much out of Romans chapter three. Uh, no one is is good. No one is is seeking mm. after God. That is that is our main issue. And um, the. Arminian students were arguing, like, you're just kind of partially affected by the fall. Now, they don't want to go straight Pelagian yeah. and, and say that you're in the same state as Adam and Eve, but you're kind of in this, you know, you've heard people say, oh, you're, you're deathbed sick. You've just got to take the elixir. Mm. Um, and so, Pel Pelagius was one of Augustine's yeah. foes, so they battled on the nature of the will, and yep. Augustine, we kind of, you know, Luther, at least for sure, you know, gets his understanding of the... The fallenness of the will from from Augustine, who is arguing Pelagius, basically saying people are good. Yeah. I mean, he was, you know, so it's so, just the environment that's the problem. Yeah. So no one says they're Pelagian today, but they would say we we would make the argument that some people are semi Pelagian. Semi, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So these these uh, these students would fall into the semi Pelagian category. Um, the next area they had an issue with um, was that of of election. And um, so they would say, no, it's, it's a conditional election. God's election is based on his ability to see who would choose him. So it's really dependent on, I would argue, the choice of man from mm -hmm. his perspective. Basically, like God can see through the corridors of time mm -hmm. and he knows who will say yes. Yes. And so still the, the agent is the human. So ultimately, yeah, man's, man's, making, man's making the decision there ultimately. It's not the Lord. He's... From eternity past, making making this decision and choosing you based yeah. on what you're going to do, and you'll very much hear that in something like Molinism today, or mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, I'm going to argue Wesleyanism or, or a different, you know, and we'll we'll have right. a, we'll have a talk about that later. But um, yeah, so unconditional election. I mean, I would say that's what the Reformation was all about. You know, when you talk about justification by grace alone through faith alone, mm -hmm. you know, those alones were arguably yeah. added, but to emphasize the point that we don't have a role in it, 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 it is unconditional, yeah. right? If it's conditioned by anything we do, then it's not grace alone or faith alone. It's our participation or our cooperation, which is a big word of the, uh, of the Reformation. So, okay. And for those that have an issue with this or, ha or struggle with some of these parts that we're unpacking as we go through here, if you understand total depravity, if total depravity actually is true, if you're not able to do anything good in and of yourself, it necessitates God to act. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really the point that you have to camp out on, even if you don't understand um, how election and predestination works, even if you don't understand why God is doing this, God never asks you to figure out why he does what mm -hmm. he does. Um, mm -hmm. He does what he does for his own glory. But mm -hmm. if you understand man's natural state and you understand the only hope that God's given— um, God's the one that has to act. And you would say it's it's tulip, not uh, let's see, lutip, uh, because because everything flows from total depravity, right? Like total depravity is, you know, kind of starts. It's the problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense, don't you? Well, yeah, it also spells tulip. That's an issue. <laughs> to get into. Because with this next one here, they're going to talk about indefinite atonement, and so the other flip side to that, which makes the L, is is limited atonement. Okay. And that always sounds so negative, right? Yeah, it people, does. People like to say, well, I just think that God could save, you know, other people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, could that, save everyone. That's, that's not really the point here. This isn't like yeah. there's you know, something limited in, in what Christ has the ability to accomplish. It's better stated with particular redemption. Yeah. You know, the, the Lord chose a particular people. Christ's atonement on the cross 
forgave particular sins that particular people would commit at particular times. And that's that's, that's the still reality. a hard pill to swallow. Well, otherwise you have the, you have otherwise you have this indefinite atonement, okay? And you have you have God. I think it's easier to swallow if you understand the reality is that if if there's not a limited atonement, if there's not a particular people, then Jesus isn't really dying for anyone. Jesus is dying for this theoretical group of people that has no real face yet, and it is yet to be defined. Yeah, I heard somebody say one time, um, I, I, I'm i on board with the L, but um, say if if God, basically if Jesus died for every person, mm-hmm. um, and then every person does not come to faith, and yeah. let's say end up in heaven, that's a very simplistic understanding, but then his death and his sacrifice was ineffectual, or not all the way effectual. And Jesus doesn't half heartedly do anything, meaning like it makes it that he sort of failed. He was like, ah, that 50 percent I got, but I didn't do the whole thing. And that that resonated for me Mm because I thought God accomplishes what he sets out to do. You know, so if anyone says no, it must be that he died for those who say yes, would say yes, did say yes. However you want to think about that. And and even the the atonement itself, it's like, you know, because I grew up in Southern Baptist and, uh, you know, they would say things to us growing up, not using Bible verse. They would say, Jesus died. He forgave every sin that anyone ever committed except for the sin of unbelief. That would be the one. That's, that's mm-hmm. the only one that you can, mm-hmm. you can get covered. Uh, the reality is you read the book of Revelation and you see the people cast into the lake of fire. And they're, it's not just unbelief. Okay, you have mm. cowardly, you have murderers, mm. you have adulterers, you have a whole list of, of sins. And that really puzzled me, like, well, wait, is it? I thought that was the only sin that there was. Hmm. But the reality is that it isn't. I mean, if the atonement of Christ covered every sin, there's no double jeopardy. It's hmm. not as though the blood of Christ covers this sin, and then you'll stand before the Lord, and he's going to charge you for a sin that's been atoned for. Mm-hmm. It, it's not been atoned for. And also, I should say, I don't want to. Lo- I'll, I might lose my Lutheran card if I don't okay. file a minority report. Okay. Uh, ju- just, just, just as a, just as a kind of placeholder to say that. So Lutherans are okay with the T. They're okay with the U. They don't like the L because they do like the the. T- they would say that you know First uh, Timothy uh, six and no First Timothy two. I'm sorry, and then um, you know John two, where they those are texts that seem to indicate that that. God wants to save the whole world, you know, mm-hmm. or, or that Jesus died for the whole world. We don't need to go over those texts. I don't want to debate those. I'm just saying mm-hmm. that those are the texts that are brought to the table to say, well, it seems like, you know, or, or God so loved the world. As you say, John you know. 3, yeah. Yeah. And so um, so Calvinist, I know, would, would argue against those, and I'm not challenging or, or arguing. But mm-hmm. for I will say this, and th- I might lose my listening card saying this, but from my point of view, what we're really talking about is eternal salvation. We're talking about God working in God's time. It, it has any all of the all of these points have an eternal view, not a contemporary view, but an eternal view, not a now. So I don't have any issue with the L because I'm not a universalist. So you know I'm kind of like, well, do I if if I if I think that Jesus died for everyone in an absolute sense, then everyone is saved. Because that's you know, kind of what I was getting at. Yes. Like yes. he accomplishes what he sets out to do. Yeah. 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 And so I'm not offended by that because I'm not offended by God judging persons. Mm-hmm. But I will say, and I think all, most Calvin, except for like hyper, super extreme, Cal, you know, I don't know, the, the, the most extreme Calvinists out there, okay. we don't know who the elect are. You would agree with that. Like we can't tell who the elect no. are. You know, we can judge a tree by its fruit, but, you know, at the end of the day, when we're talking about eternal things, we don't oh know who God the elect are. So. Yeah. So anyway, so I don't have this huge issue with L. I, I, I don't really know why people do. If it's we don't know who the elect are now. Well, it doesn't um, seem fair that God would save yeah. some and not because you said that people have a problem with the limited because it sounds like Christ's power is limited. Yes. I think people have a problem with limited because it sounds unfair. Like some people are getting a, a free pass, like a a card, and you take that card and then you get to heaven. And some people don't mm-hmm. get the card. Yeah. Um, so I think that's and yeah, and critics of Calvinism, I think, like provisionists, like say Leighton Flowers, for example, would oh. be a, a you know well known um, a critic of Calvinism these days, and he would say, yeah, er, you know, it who would want to who would who could ever worship a God that predestines people to hell before they're ever born? 
Right. Right. And so uh, we can maybe come back to that loaded rhetorical question later. Yeah, it, it really but, is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not defending it. I'm just yeah. putting it out there. But okay, so limited atonement is definitely, I think, a stumbling block for a lot of people because they, they, they hate this idea that, you know, God isn't just going to save everyone. But yeah, and I think I think if I think particular redemption is more helpful because that that puts it more in a positive sense instead of the negative sense, in that Jesus you know had a particular people that he was he was dying for in particular sins that that he was covering uh, at that time. Yeah, so that's been helpful for me. Gotcha. Um, okay, we're coming up on the one that that trips me up, so I'm curious how y'all. What? Yeah, the eye, irresistible grace. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. Yeah. irresistible grace. Um, so this was this was an issue for uh, the Armenian students, and they said, "No, you have resistible grace." So even though the Spirit speaks to every heart and does all that He can, almost to uh, bring maybe I'm not being charitable there, but does all that He can mm-hmm. to bring men to Christ. That's kind of the idea that you end up with is God. You kind of hit on that a little bit. Mm-hmm. God's doing what He can here, and now He didn't accomplish it. Mm-hmm. And so now you have that with the Spirit here. The Spirit's doing all that He can. Um, you know, but unless that, that person is going to, um, act themselves and believe upon Christ, they're not going to be saved. And certainly that's true. If the person doesn't believe upon Christ, they're not going to be saved. But if we understand this through the lens of total depravity, where we began, um, and we understand Paul's writing and Paul saying that no one seeks after God and no one's doing good, uh, to believe upon Christ is, is most definitely a good thing. It's an excellent thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so even that good thing you are not able to do Mm -hmm. apart from the work of God within you. You, It's kind of like Lazarus in the tomb, and he's there, and Jesus says, come forward. That's an absurd thing to say, (laughs) unless you're the son of God, and you're going to bring the person to life. And that's exactly what preaching is. You are preaching to dead people, and you're Mm. telling them to come to Jesus. Well, how are they going to come to Jesus? Jesus has to bring them to life. He's got to open their eyes so they can see. Well, But Lazarus, why was he obedient to Jesus? Why did he walk out of the tomb? Because he was alive. Living people don't stay in tombs. Mm -hmm. He was obedient to Jesus, but after Jesus had had given him life. You see the Mm -hmm. same idea (laughs) with Ezekiel preaching to the the bones. What sense does that make? (laughs) Well, you know, who gets the glory in this ultimately? Well, God God, gets the glory. Um, So uh, I think one thing that I would love to hear you talk about a little bit, just since we're talking about Calvinism is freedom and free will. So the I irresistible Mm -hmm. grace is this notion that you, when, when God pursues you, you can't say no. Okay. Right. Would that be kind of a fair way to say, to summarize the I? Okay. So, so, um, so when we walk into, you know, the, the institutes of the Christian religion, uh, Calvin does deal with the idea of will. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so let, let's let's unpack that right now. So so the idea of of will does Calvin believe in free will? That would be a question you can ask, and you might mm-hmm. say no. Well, it depends what you mean by free. It right. depends what you mean by will. And so the Reformed understanding is going to uh, have y'all heard of the fourfold state of man? No. Nope. I don't know. But okay. pull that mic a little closer if you can. Yes. Yeah. So the fourfold state of man um, understands man's will. And you see it broken up this way in the 1689, I know for sure, on the chapter on free will. 1689 is the London Baptist yeah. Confession. Comes after, what, what is the main, uh, the, the main, Westminster Confession is kind of the main. So you have the Westminster, okay. and then out of that came the Congregationalists that, that wrote the Savoy Declaration. Okay. Uh, John Owen was influential there. And then the Congregationalists influenced the Baptists. And so the Baptists okay. in the 1689 got most of their content out of the Savoy. So spoiler alert, the Baptists don't really come from the Anabaptists. The, the, Fair to the say? The Baptists do not come from the Anabaptists. Okay. They come right. from the Reformed. But that's a spoiler. But back, back, yeah. back okay. So 1689 is the London. Yeah. So if you, if, you know, uh, uh, if, if you're a Reformed Baptist, you hold the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Yeah. Uh, okay. Carry on. Sorry. So, okay. for, so for, for what do you mean by free? What do you mean so, by will? So, uh, yeah, so what do you mean by free? What do you mean by will? Well, so you, you need to understand man's state in any given uh, circumstance. And so you have Adam and Eve. All right, you have Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve could walk in righteousness, mm-hmm. or they also could sin. They have the ability to do both. We call that the state of innocence. Okay, Adam and Eve sinned. Okay, they're affected, and everyone that came after them were affected. Okay, that's a state that that's a, that's a state of sin now. So you had innocence. Now you have sin. Man in a state of sin 
is not able to do anything that's righteous. He's mm-hmm. not able to do anything that is good. He's only able to do sin. Now, as you already mentioned, Evan, it doesn't mean that you're as bad as you possibly can be. You can think of the most wicked person that you've ever seen in history. They could have been worse <laughs> than, than they are. It's hard to believe, but the reality is sure. it's it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so after that, you have what we would call the state of grace. And the state of grace is where God has worked upon someone they have come to faith in Christ Jesus. Their eyes have been opened. They have understanding. And you now, in that state, have the ability to walk in righteousness, to be obedient to the moral law of God, something that you were only able to do from that point forward. You weren't able to do that in the state of sin. So in the state of grace, you have the ability to walk in righteousness. You have the ability to sin. Pause. And, yes, ma'am. In the state of grace, do you have the ability to not make that choice? Do you have the ability to say, that sounds good, but no? You do that every day. You do that every day. Well, that's the so point. I, so, well, so if you're in the state of grace, then the Lord has already acted upon you. You've already been affected. Otherwise, you would have to hold to kind of this Arminian idea of, of prevenient grace. Mm-hmm. And so God has, has, has kind of opened your eyes a little bit, given you a little life, not quite brought you to life yet. And now you get to make that choice. And I would say experientially... People probably experience that, and that's that's kind of what that's they. What what, that's like. what it feels like. Sure, but you don't have prevenient grace in the scriptures. I would argue when Paul's walking through the book of Romans, we don't see him explain this middle state of existence. You go from from darkness to light. You don't go from darkness to what's a little bit dim now. And am I sure. going to turn the light on the rest of the way? Okay, I will but I'm not that sure that that answers. Go ahead. I didn't no. answer your question. Okay. okay. Well, well, just to say for the listener, we're going to talk about prevenient grace when um, our our Methodist friend yes is here. So listen, listen out for that concept. But what sure. was the what what wasn't answered? Maybe you could try again. Or so it's and done. maybe maybe this is semantics. I mean, I hate okay. when people say that when it's not, but maybe this actually is. Um, when you're in a state of grace and God has called you forth to life, you don't have a choice but to live. Is that what you're saying? Well, I would say you are alive. Well, let's think about let's think about okay, Lazarus. Okay, so it is semantics. So, so well, did did Lazarus make himself alive? No. Well, why did he walk out of the tomb? Because he had the ability to do that. I Jesus guess. commanded Wanted him. To. That's you know, that is what living people do. They don't live in tombs, and so God brought him to life. And he walked out of the tomb. Um, and so th- that's I mean, that's kind of a a picture there of what that's that's what many of these. Um, you know, miracles that happen. That's what they're demonstrating is, is, is Jesus is demonstrating physically what God is doing spiritually in, in the life yeah, of Yeah, I think maybe that's where the hiccup is. And, and you're yeah. doing, this is, the Lazarus illustration is actually very helpful um, because what it seems, you, you talked about experientially how it feels. Yeah, and I think how sure. it feels yeah. or how it seems to us is we know someone who has heard the gospel right. over and over again, like yeah, really yeah. clearly, yeah. really compassionately. Yeah. Um, the, all the right words have been said and yeah. they still say no. But you're saying God has not called them to life. He has not, yeah. that, that we know of sure. at this point sure. for the sake of the illustration, right? That. Um, or we could turn on the other side of that and we could say this, we say, okay, well, God's not called this, What? but when you came to faith in Christ, when you came to faith in Christ, which of us is going to say, it's because I was so wise. It's because no. I just... So wrote... that none may boast. No, I would not <laughs> do that. You know what I mean there? So like when you look at it that way, you're like, oh, no, no, wait a minute. Let me get away from that. I don't want to say that this was about me and about my choice. It's easier to talk about it when it's this kind of theoretical person, but when it's us personally, we're like... No, I know myself. I know where I would have been. The Lord acted upon me. Okay. Well, I don't want to belabor the point anymore. That's been helpful. Okay. Still wrestle with it. Maybe a little less. Can can I, can I say, because this will deal with the P as well, the perseverance of the saints, which is, is this a formulation that deals with the question of election? Because if so, it seems like if we're answering everything kind of backwards from the, the, the point of election, well, Mm -hmm. of course, grace was irresistible to the elect, you know, because they're elect. And of course, you know, they're, they're, they, 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 persevere because they're of the elect. Whereas you see clearly in the New Testament, people who are, you know, they left us because they were never of us, Mm -hmm. right? Or you see people who are part of the community who leave the community and then Paul has to deal with, you know, I can't remember the names of, you know, he and and, and John both are are very hard on these these gentlemen who have now caused, you know, trouble in in the community. 
So I don't know if it's if it's a bad election though. It's like I don't really, you know. Of course, it's it sh- should be the case that they're going to persevere. Like they, they they're not going to be able to say no to grace. Or do you think it has more like day to day relevance? You know these these theological ideas of perseverance and so forth. Well, it does have day to day relevance, of course. Um, and so uh, and the last the the last the the last state um, the. Yeah, fourth, I interrupted you we, before we didn't that. Say Sorry. that is going to be the state of glory, glory where you're yeah. ultimately going going to be glorified. But but let's let's think about what you're saying here, day to day applicability of these of these ideas. You must not look at Calvinism and think that John Calvin was teaching that that we are just automatons, we're just robots, and we're just God made me this way. Yeah, this is we're what, puppets. This, yeah, yeah, I'm just puppets. Yeah. Um, Man is doing what he does because that's what he desires to do. Man who is sinning is not being made to sin by God. All right, he's walking headlong into what what he desires to do. Even God hardening the heart of someone like Pharaoh, you don't have God making him to to sin. You have God restraining. You know what would have normally mm-hmm. just been okay. This is painful. I'm going to stop doing this. No, even that was restrained in Pharaoh so that he would walk headlong into that which was deep within his heart, that which he actually desired to do. And so that that needs to be understood here in that mm-hmm. each of these states, okay, in the fourfold state, each of them, man is acting according to his nature at that time. He's acting according to the desires of his heart. He's not being forced into doing mm-hmm. anything there. And that's that's the reality for each of us in our lives. That's why we're accountable for the things things that we do. Mm-hmm. And Isaiah 10, qu- quoted often in these debates, but the uh, God uses the kingdom of Assyria to go conquer the northern kingdoms, mm-hmm. and then later he punishes Assyria yep. for, their, for their arrogance and, you know, wickedness. So, you know, that's an example where they fully chose, the king of Assyria fully chose, you know, to be, yeah. to be, uh, to do evil, and God used that. We could look so. at the life of Joseph. Right. Yeah. I mean, what what you meant for evil, God, God meant for good. for good. God, God is so sovereign that He is using even these sinful desires of men to accomplish His purpose. And this is really difficult for us when we see great tragedy in life, and we'll be like Job and say, "Why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to someone else?" And something I found so helpful in life and in theology is to step back and think about Christ and His death, and and I think about what is the greatest act of injustice that's ever occurred. And I think it is most definitely the death of Christ upon the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, he that, that was completely unjust. And God used that, all right? God even, you know, ordained that men would do certain things there, but they were acting freely through their own desires to accomplish their purpose. But God had another intention for that. You know, Pilate had his intention of what he did. Herod has his intention. The Jewish leaders had their intention. Those standing around Jesus that said, crucify him, had their intention. But the Lord ultimately had his intention of redemption. And I find that to be so beautiful and so helpful to me that when I see any great tragedy, and I'm like, why, Lord? It's okay for us to say why. It's not okay mm-hmm. for us to, to charge God, though, because mm-hmm. if God can use that act of injustice mm-hmm. to save all of us, um, who am I to question? Right. Anything that he does, and we have Joseph as well as a mm-hmm. as a story that his 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 brothers sold him into slavery. I mean, he he suffered as a slave. He was thrown into prison um, unjustly, and the God used all of that to work in his life, to um, work in his brother's life. You see, you see his brother standing before him, saying, "Take my life, not my brother." Mm-hmm. Whereas before he's throwing his brother's life out, he's wanting, you know, God had worked in their lives. God mm-hmm. had worked in Joseph's life. And so I find that to be very comforting. Yeah. Okay, P. I don't, did we cover P? No. We didn't cover okay. P. Perseverance, perseverance, of the saints, okay. perseverance of the saints. And if you want to take a, a really bad uh, Southern Baptist view of this, it'd be once saved, always, always saved. saved. But that's not what this is talking about. This is not just about, okay... I walked down the aisle, I signed a card, I said a prayer, I put, I put, you know, I, I wrote the, the date in the back of my Bible so that, you know, Satan can, can't ever question it. This is, <laughs> this is, commun- mm, that was good. Sorry. Yeah, those Continue. are real things. That I, are said. I didn't know about that last one, but okay. Yeah. You're supposed to write that, th- you know, I didn't realize Satan was reading the last pages of people's Bibles to find out if he could. Well, Cause that's where you put <laughs> my name's in, emblazoned on the front of my Bible. So but the yeah. front apparently is not the place with I, gold. I she likes to come in from no, the no, end no. or something. But anyway, but anyway, People, well, but people are people. This f- kind of false assurance, right? Of yeah, you, well, you make a decision and bam, you know. 
I, yes, and I say this as a Calvinist, that these are some of the most difficult people to save, is those that walked down the aisle when they were four, six, eight, said a prayer after someone else, wrote their name in the back of the Bible with this date, and that person will be standing in front of you, absolutely drunk on the street corner of Houston, telling you not of the faith that's in them and the work of God in their life, but rather of, of this Bible they have at home with this date in the back. That is not perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints is stating the doctrine that God will complete that which he has begun in you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Salvation is not just about, and all of you agree with this, it's not just about going to heaven or just being justified. There is, there is an entire work that the Lord is doing in your life. And so you are going to be sanctified immediately and you're going to be sanctified progressively. You're ultimately going to be going to be glorified as we would see in the, um, you know, the, the Ordo Salutis. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the idea of perseverance of the saints. Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation. Order of salvation. And, and different people put forth different versions of it, kind of what happens in progression. But, you know, certainly we would agree, uh, we would agree that say justification and sanctification are, are distinct uh, mm -hmm. processes, distinct works of God in one's life, uh, a criticism we might have of the East, like Eastern Orthodoxies, they don't really separate those things at all. So justification is itself an ongoing process, and sanctification is an ongoing process. So um, but anyway, but... To, to say um, that it's sort of reductionist to say, you know, once saved, always saved, it is still correct if you're using the word saved the same way, right? I mean... Let's call the word saved justified. Sure. Then once you're justified, you can't be unjustified. Once you're justified, you're always justified. But what is the means that the Lord uses to justify someone? And that is that they are going to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to see the seriousness of their sin, the greatness of their sin. They're going to see no hope in themselves, and they're going to turn to the Lord and trust upon him. That's the means why through which they're saved. Absolutely, once saved, always saved, according to that. Okay, the Scripture does not teach that if you ask Jesus in your heart, that you're always saved. The Scripture does not teach that if you have this religious experience, where if they dim the lights right and play the music slow, and the counselors go to the front first, and, and then you go and you follow after this, and then you never darken the doors of a church again. That, that's not Christianity. Um, yeah, and I would say even—here's where I, I think there's some agreement and disagreement, but I like— even if you baptize someone when they're 30, you know, and they've studied every world religion and they've, yeah. they've chosen Christianity and they've spent three years studying Calvin's Institutes or whatever they may be, they still can fall, you know, away. You know, this happened in the New Testament. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's no perfect solution. That's why, that's why when we talk about election, you know, it's uh, – we don't know who the elect are. You know, we, we kind of carry forth as a church the best we can. It's the wheat and the tares. You know, you have, mm -hmm. you have those mm -hmm. in God's kingdom in your midst and those who – and we Seems know some tears. Exactly. Okay, so, but anyway, okay. W was there a, um one of, one of the remonstrance articles against the P? What did did they, did they say something about that? I'm sorry, I'm going back. Oh yeah, but. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't actually, I didn't say that one. It was uh, basically defectible grace. You can fall away. Okay. And so that that's the reality. So I like I said, I come from Southern Baptist background. Well, at the very least, all the Southern Baptists were one point Calvinists because they all would say, "Well, I'm once saved, always saved." Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so it doesn't matter what you do or how you live. Um, then Oof. you know, yeah. you're still you're still saved. That's that's inconsistent with what you see right. in you know in teaching on you know John and his epistles and in many other places and the teachings of Jesus and Paul. Um, but they did believe you could you could fall away from grace. Yeah. And you see this idea communicated in, uh, I think, Church of Christ would hold to this. Assemblies of God would be another one that, that would hold to this 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 very um, strict Arminian mm -hmm. idea, which makes it not, honestly, It's is it really grace? I mean, because then your works do come into it. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe this is assumed, but Roman Catholics hold to that. So, uh, you know, James White uh, interviewed, I think he debated, I think it was maybe Trent Horn. But anyway, it's one of the Catholic Answers guys mm -hmm. several years ago. On the question of the P, on the perseverance of the saints. So now my only thought when I did listen to that debate, and I listened several times, was that they they did seem to be speaking past one another a little bit. Because, again, in the New Testament, people are in the church and they leave the church. But I don't think that's really what—I don't know that that's what perseverance of the saints is talking about. I think it of the, the elect will always be elect. But maybe I'm simplifying it You're too You're not going to fall from a state of justification. 
Because yeah. in Roman Catholicism, right. you would have peace with God. You would be justified. Right. You were, they would even say you're justified at the point where you're baptized. Right, right. Um, which then led to people wanting to wait to get baptized as long as they can. So um, that would be a difference is that they would actually go so far as to say that you can be justified and lose your justification. Yeah. We would say, you know, people can leave church membership or what have you, but we would just say they just weren't ever of us. Well, that would be like what John says, right? They left yeah. us because they were not of us. Yeah. And people can put on a show. Judas Iscariot, yeah. three years. Yeah. He was the treasurer. Yeah. He was doing miracles along with everyone else, it seems. Mm-hmm. Nobody was questioning anything about him. Let's talk about the, the institutes. Okay. So these are, this is really Calvin being a systematic theologian. How long are they? How sure. long did he write them? You know? so, yeah, it began in 1536 uh, and then revised it uh, four more times and then ultimately in 1559 began with six chapters and by the end of it it was it was 80 chapters i don't know what would have happened if he stayed alive longer if it just would have kept growing and growing <laughs> yeah. and growing and so it's broken up into in, in, into into four books you want to walk through the four books yeah give it kind of a high overview okay so first book is basically on the knowledge of god as as the creator um as i said earlier calvin didn't believe that you know, theology was just this academic endeavor that the heart had to be um, within it. He despised the uh, the scholastics. And um, so the first book, he deals with theology and anthropology. So our understanding of God, our understanding of, of man. Calvin, in this book, does not try to prove God's existence. It's Calvin, not apologetics. <laughs> yeah, he... he, he he assumed the existence of God, and he believed that all people knew that that there was a God. Um, he basically well, Paul kind of says that in Romans one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Romans one is yeah. very much informing this this idea, and um, you know you don't need to prove God's existence to the honest person, and so there was no point in proving the existence to a denier because that person was suppressing the truth. So I wouldn't say he was a presuppositionalist, but but certainly influenced by uh, you know the these biblical yeah, ideas. But almost every presuppositionalist today is a Calvinist, and there's a yeah. reason for that. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. I agree with that. Um, and so the truth about God is all, all all, around man. He's got some famous quotes like, the heart is a factory of idols. Oh, that's Calvin. Yeah. Somehow I thought that was Augustine this whole time. All right, Calvin. Yeah. Wow. That's a good quote. That would have been good on Twitter. If it would only. have gone viral, trending. If only. It, it would have trended for about an hour, and then something else would have come up. And... Um, Calvin believed, as far as his understanding of Scripture, that it had, it had uh, you know, greater authority than, than the church, meaning that basically someone who's occupying a position in the church um, is held accountable to Scripture. Um, and so, you know, um, Roman Catholic leaders would argue that, well, you know, the Scriptures come from the church. Uh, Calvin would argue rather that... Um, no, the church and the councils of the church were merely acknowledging what was already evident. Amen. And you do have much history in that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that should sound familiar. That was Huss's, one mm-hmm. of his main arguments. Was it, it, These are all, you know, authority conflicts, basically. But, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So he would argue, as Luther would, that the sufficiency of the scripture for, you know, doctrine, et cetera. So, yeah. okay. Uh, second book, he, he goes into, you know, how, how do you know God as... As, as redeemer, um, and so in this he, he emphasizes you know the necessity to recognize the greatness, the seriousness of of your own sin. He would say that you know we have to hate our sin before before we can love God. If we don't rightly identify our problem, there's not going to be an opportunity to uh, to you know to access what God has made available for us in Christ Jesus, hmm. and, and that's really applicable to you know this this time and. Most times, really, because, you know, we, we see the problems in the world, we see pain, we see suffering, and we, we think, well, this, you know, we could solve these problems if we just had enough education. And, well, that doesn't really solve the issue. If you remember Enron a few years back, there were very educated people that participated mm-hmm. in that. I remember Dwight Moody was, had an illustration, and he said, you know, if you have, if you have a young man, he's working for, um, you know, the rail yard, and he's stealing you know, bolts, and uh, he, he's stealing tools, and you go and you send him to university, he's going to come back and he's going to steal uh, the entire company. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You know, it, education 
in itself, although ignorance has its problems in life, education doesn't deal with a real issue. Uh, money doesn't solve man's real mm -hmm. problem. Um, culture doesn't solve man's real problem. That was the issue with the Third Reich coming out of Germany. It's a very cultured area. Yeah. And um, But that didn't deal with man's real problem. The root of the problem is our our sinful nature. And so, there, there, you know, there's a, there's a temptation to, you know, kind of lessen the... Uh, the law of God and Calvin deals, uh, you know, very specifically with this. And I think I think the uh, the theology that I've derived from Calvin has been has been very very helpful with this, is to understand the highness of the law of God. When Jesus is talking about, you know, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, the uh, the moral law of God and the violation of the moral law of God, that it's you know it's it's not something. Um, that, that man can attain, and it's something that is of, of great, great, great seriousness. Um, That's all in book two, huh? There's a lot more in book two. I yeah. mean, I just, uh, grabbed, just making sure. He, he's giving us the high over yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, hate, I hate to pass up on the three uses of the law, but we'll, we'll do that. We'll, talk, we'll save that for another day. That's fine. But, yeah. Let's go to, let's look at book three. Book three. Um, so, so, so we get in. We we get into book three, and uh, we we've kind of hit a lot of on book three already in in what we've uh, in what we've talked about with with Tulip. A lot of that was you know, but he deals there with kind of the the Christian experience of coming to faith in Christ, the experience of uh, forgiveness and uh, you know regeneration, and um, you know that's kind of that's really what's unpacked there. Okay. And then the last book. So the last book he deals with, uh, you know, the, the Holy Catholic Church, how, how God deals with us outwardly uh, in grace. And he, he makes it clear in this book that the work of God in the life of the Christian is something that's happening in community. It's something that's happening, it's happening in the church. And um, God works in the life of the Christians through what he would call ordinary means of grace. Yeah, it's a classic Ordinary means of grace. Yeah, and so you know that's that's the means that the Lord has given, um, you know, for the life uh, of the Christian. And would you uh, all use the word sacrament, like word and sacrament? That's what we would say are means of grace or ordinance or ordinance or sacrament. I'd be fine with that yeah. one. I mean, they kind of make the word up. A sacrament can mean different things to different people, but yeah, we we have to touch quickly before we're we're out of time. But okay, the the one of the critiques because I saw you said something about missions. One of the critiques of yeah. Of all Calvinists is that, well, why bother, you know, evangelizing, evangelizing if everyone's predestined? So yeah. maybe talk about that. Yeah. And so, you know, an understanding of Calvin is that you need to understand that, you know, God ordained um, the ends as well as the means. And so God has has called mm. people to be saved, but he's also ordained certain things to happen in the life of that person so they would come to faith in Christ. And when you look at the life of Calvin, you you find someone that overwhelmingly was involved in, in missions. And you had people mm -hmm. that were fleeing from France at this time. They were uh, refugees in Geneva. They were sitting under his preaching. And you had a great many of these refugees that, that heard his preaching and overwhelmingly desired to go back to France. And they desired to go back, and they did. He raised up thousands of missionaries. Mm. Um, over 2,000 churches, it is reported, were planted mm. by the men that were raised up by Calvin, and they went back into France, and a great many of them yeah. died on the mission field. Yeah. I just, I just think it's unfair that people say about Calvinists in their, in their traditions, well, they don't do missions. Well, that's just not true. I mean, there could be some that would that would have, a, I would argue, a cold heart toward the unbeliever. You know, I always you hear know, about these, these hard-shell Calvinists. And I, I I never meet them. I never <laughs> yeah. I never find these churches. I, I would imagine that. Well, they have a conference every year at the. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. But I, I, it's a caricature. And I, I think, think it I, is. I think it's unfair. Well, and so. just a second one to put on there, uh, which is similar, is I think of people thinking that Calvinists don't care as much about obedience, because. You know, once you're saved and you're elect, it had nothing to do with you. God saved you. And now you can live however you want. And and so, like, because the, the normal answer to why evangelize, the, one of the first answers is because God told you to. Mm -hmm. Right. Jesus said to go into all the earth. But maybe the Calvinists don't care about that because you don't have to do what God says because mm -hmm. you just live your life and you're saved and you're fine. So I don't know if you want to speak uh, yeah, to that or except, not. Except, yeah, William Carey. 
you know, what some would consider to be the, you know, great grandfather of the modern missions movement was a Calvinist. Charles Spurgeon was a Calvinist. Calvin obviously uh, was a Calvinist. And, you know, I've done much evangelism in my life. And I can tell you the times when I was an Arminian, um, there was a great burden upon me because I would be asking myself, well, man, if I just argued it right. If I would have studied more, yep. And you, you you put all this this upon you, and if you understand the means the Lord uses is the proclamation of the gospel. This is what I need to do. I don't have to, you know, make it be upon me whether or not this person is saved, whether or not I gave the best argument. I need to trust in the means that God has given, and it is an absurd thing from a worldly standard just to proclaim the gospel or just to preach. And Paul says it is so. It is, yeah. it, it is absurd. But it's <laughs> absurd to tell someone who's dead in a tomb to come out, especially when they've been there for four days. Um, this is what the Lord has called us to do, and he's the one that gets the glory. Right? Yeah. Ab- absolutely. On, right? Yeah. Yeah. First Corinthians 1. Yeah, go read it. Um, go read know, it. The, the, the foolishness, and it's, it's wonderful. Good stuff. Okay. Um, Aaron, people can find you at Grace Family Baptist Church. Uh, what's your website? Uh, www.gracefamilybaptist.net and I think this actually might come out before anyway I know you guys are having Vody Bauckham speak at uh, former preacher at Grace Family for how long yes. was he there he's there what he 10, there 15? Nine, nine years nine years okay yeah. so uh, before he went to Zambia to do his uh, missions right his, right. his outreach right. his yeah. evangelism one of those Calvinists that don't care about missions yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so he'll be he'll be in town uh, brisket and, and Balcom uh coming up anyway go to go to your yeah. your website october uh, 20th october 20th so um anyway sarah's at memorial drive if you like that version of calvinism better <laughs> mdpc.org i'm evan i'm here at first lutheran we have more mild calvinism uh, at the lutheran <laughs> church sounds like we're talking about barbecue yeah yeah well actually uh now yes. that you mention it anyway thanks so much for listening until next time we encourage you to question freely think deeply and disagree as needed 